and as you may have read, our speaker today is Dr. Nahid Siamdust, who is an assistant professor of media and Middle East studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, before I take the pleasure and honor of introducing uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Siam Dust, I would like to highlight one more upcoming event for this month on September the 27th at 3 p.m. Uh, Professor Emeritus Charles Smith is giving a talk on Zoom in which he will present a historical overview of the Arab-Israeli uh, uh, conflict. This event is part of a series on the CMES Diverse Perspectives on Palestine and Israel. The event will be held virtually via Zoom. Please check the event tab on the CMES website to register for this event and also for the coming ones in the same series. Now, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Nahid Siam Dost, who is an assistant professor of media and Middle East studies at the University of Texas at Austin. She holds a PhD in modern Middle East studies from the University of Oxford in the UK and a Master's of International Affairs from the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Before joining the Department of Middle East Studies at UT Austin, Dr. Siam Dust was a visiting assistant professor of women's studies and anthropology of religion in the Harvard Divinity School. And this was in 2020-2021. Before that, for four years, she was a postdoc associate in Iranian studies and also a lecturer in Anthropology and Near Eastern Studies at Yale University from 2017 to 2020. She also was a research scholar for a year at New York University in the academic year of 2015-2016. Dr. Nahid Siamdost's research focuses on Middle East cultural production and politics, Iranian, national and international culture and media, and social media and disinformation. Dr. Siam Dost's first large research project that culminated from her, from her dissertation was a book titled The Soundtrack of the Revolution, The Politics of Music in Iran. It was published in, by Stanford University Press in 2017. This is a wonderful book, a fine-grained study of the musical discourses and media use in the constitution and development of the public sphere in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Research in Iran over the period of seven years, the soundtrack of the revolution broke new ground by demonstrating a profound and, and a powerful way in which the works of cultural production and the multi-layered mediations can register the dissent and create the political alignments within an authoritarian political sphere. It also indicates the power of productive abilities and how this shape forces in its own image. By centering a discussion of media and its importance in the 20th century Iranian politics, her book contributes to a growing literature that claims popular culture and media as key sites of analysis across the Middle East. The book Soundtrack of the Revolution was based on her dissertation, as I just mentioned, which won the Middle East Studies Association Dissertation Prize Award and also the Douglas Lea Memorial Prize from the British Society for Middle East Studies. It's a quite unique to find one dissertation that gets two awards, and there was Dr. Nahid Siam Dost. Dr. Nahid Siam Dost gave a good number of invited talks around her book at a good number of institutions, including the University of Toronto, University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, UC Berkeley, San Francisco State, UC Santa Barbara, UC Irvine, and UCLA. She gave other invited talks about her recent work on social media, music, and the poetic world making in Iranian public at a good number of institutions also. And this includes University of British Columbia, Harvard, American University of Beirut, University of Michigan, and also at Northwestern. Dr. Nahid Siamdost also co-edited a volume titled The Nightingale, the Nightingale Re Rebuilds, Popular Music and Society in Modern Iran, and it's forthcoming, as far as I see, with Harvard University Press. Her open ed writing also, in a good number of genres, has been published in very popular magazines and newspapers, including the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and also Jedalia, which is a common one about and also in Arabic. And she also often appears on English, German, and Iranian media. Dr. Nahid Siamdost's CV lists 15 awards and honors, 
These include fellowship in women's studies in religion in the religion program at Harvard University, the endowed lecture at Simon Fraser University, and also the fellowship in Iranian studies program at Yale, and I just mentioned the dissertation award by the Middle East Studies Association. Her recent research, and I think part of this will be the topic of today's conversation, examines the role of various media technologies in the constitution of poetic world making among Iranian publics in the post-1979 Iran, with a special view to the performances and discussions around the concept of joy and the centrality of women in these discourses. Here, she is investigating the emergence of both analog and digital collectivities and personalities vis-a-vis -vis the state-imposed dogmatic religiosity, placing the analysis of social and transnational media and how this impacts the core of this research for future researchers. Dr. Nahid Siamdost's talk related to this recent research, as I just mentioned, and her talk today is entitled Iranian Publics and Collective Joy, Mobilizing Everyday Effects. In this talk, she will focus on the emergence and significance of women breaking into spontaneous dance in public spheres in Iran. She will also talk about the key concepts that she will uh, unpack, including the bodily autonomy, the concept of joy, and how this manifests in the public dance. Also, she will trace the history and the significance of these viral dance videos in Iran and the agent of potential of public joy. She will also show the impact of these instances of public dancing and their digital articulations on social media. She will discuss how to interpret this social phenomenon within theories and approaches of agency and everyday resistance without assigning a purely political subjectivity to the subaltern. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nahid Siamdost. Dr. Azaz, thank you so much for this deep research and introduction. I really appreciate it. This is um, really a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. And uh, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the School of Middle East and North Africa Studies, and the Roshan Institute, as well as the New School of Global Studies at the University of Arizona for this invitation to Dr. Talatov also, and to Dr. Ellison, as well as to Ms. Rickleffs for um, all the behind the scenes work. I really appreciate this invitation and it's an honor to be able to speak to you today. I hope I can do um, your description of the talk. Uh, I assume that was a description that I sent a while ago. Um, <laughs> those sort of summarize and synthesize um, across my work. Uh, I hope I can do it justice. So in this talk, and I'm going to be sharing my screen, um, previously there was uh, a little box that made sure you could share your sound. I just want to make sure I click that one because I do have sound that I will be sharing. Um, uh, added, uh, for a okay, um, just to give, I hope you can see, okay, I'm, I'm, in, I'm on the wrong slide but I should be in the, in the right slide now. So in this talk, I highlight a chapter in my second book project tentatively titled Joyous Iran, Performing Politics, Mediating Authenticity, where I trace the ways in which Iranians over the course of 40 years of living in an Islamic Republic have used various media forms to create spaces of sociality independent of state control. For this chapter, I'm studying the circulation of joyous dance videos on social media and the centrality of women's spontaneous performances in the untethering of their bodies from the state's biopolitics of control. I argue that these spaces afforded rehearsal opportunities for the kinds of performatives that we have seen in the Woman Life Freedom Uprising that broke out in Iran in September of uh, 2022, following the death and custody of Mahsa Jina Amini, the 22-year-old uh, Kurdish uh, woman. And since uh, we have Dr. Talatov present here, I would like to cite the prescient note uh, that he struck in, a, uh, in his 2011 book about the female artist Shahzad, where he wrote, there's no doubt in his mind that any future uprising would be led by women. And so it was. My first book was on the politics of music in, uh, in Iran, as Dr. Azaz mentioned, soundtrack of the revolution, and examines how both state uh, regulatory bodies and state aligned and independent music makers leverage music for their own world-making practices. 
In my new project, music still plays an important role, as does dance, um, as I examine discourses around the affect of joy, shadi in Persian, and how they have come to constitute structures of feeling that produce anti-regime subjectivities. Drawing on Asif Bayot's notion of quiet encroachment and Michel de Certeau's uh, everyday practices, I argue that through continuing ordinary life practices prevalent in Iranian culture, such as the presence of music and dance in social gatherings, Iranians have maintained an affective sociality and an embodied ethics that by extension afford political agency. Cautious not to inscribe adjunctive resistance into daily acts, I argue that although joyful practices have not necessarily been maintained for political purposes, they have afforded a discursive space that by now reads political. This is especially evident in social media circulations of such affects and adjacent uh, commentaries, which posit these scenes as representing authentic Persian culture versus state-imposed Islamic culture. My book examines the various publics and media spaces that Iranians have cultivated and harnessed in post-revolutionary Iran uh, vis-a-vis the Islamic Republic. At the core, these liberatory practices continue to create narratives that other the restrictive state as not truly Iranian. I use some terms that I want to flesh out here a little bit. So I, ha- I have used um, the term world making already, poetic world making. And what I mean by that Um, are the rhetorical and performative means uh, that a public employs to give shape to the world that it aspires to inhabit. The term world making itself was first coined by Nelson Goodman to suggest that many other worlds can plausibly exist as the world we currently know. The idea being that the world is a malleable construct and that people can engage in its creation through their creative work. I'm going to move on because uh, the Michael Warner's um, work on counter publics is requires potentially a slide. Um, the other is my use of the various notions of the public, um, and you know, and drawing on Michael Warner's work, uh, influential work on publics and counter publics. I'm really sort of relying on some of the delineations that he has for the public, such as um, you know that publics uh, are um, is basically a public is a relation among strangers. A public is constituted through mere attention to a discourse. In my case, uh, I'm, uh, you know, zooming in on the discourses around shadi. A public is ultimately poetic world making, and a counter public, as opposed to a public, so a counter public has many of the same attributes as, as a public, um, but as opposed to a public, it maintains an awareness of its subordinate status and the political and cultural horizon against which it marks itself off as a dominant one. Um, while relying on Warner's definition of the term as a basis, I don't think it's fully sufficient for a formulation of the Iranian public, as we need to consider this entirely other underground or alternative public sphere that people engage in on a daily basis. For this, I draw on Hamid Dabashi's recent concept of a para-public sphere, uh, which he articulate, articulates to be integral to the official public sphere. Here he writes, the formation of the Iranian public sphere is entirely contingent on the formation of this para-public domain where the visual and performing arts, as well as literary and poetic discourses, become definitive to the nature and disposition of the public sphere and in fact have an organic connection to it. So in my case, I'm really uh, looking at the role of music and dance and facilitating the, um, you know, the uh, particular sort of um, uh, uh, qualities uh, of, of the public that I'm looking at. I also use Jill Dolan's notion of utopian performatives, as well as Sarah Larson's counter-publicity, a more active and adjunctive form of Warner's counter-public. And in order to grapple, this is the last term I'm going to throw at you, but in order to grapple with the notion of agency in the public formations that I'll be discussing, I also draw on Manuel de Landa's assemblage theory from the French word uh, agencement. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. It's uh, agencement is, uh, you know, sort of this collective agency is a, is a better word than assemblage, but we're stuck with assemblage in the, in the English work on this theory, which... Um, is really work in redistributing the capacity to act from the individual to group formations, acknowledging material interdependencies and uh, discursive networks. So in Dario Minervini's words, assemblage is intended as both the process and the outcome of a connection, that is to say, 
a multiplicity of heterogeneous entities interrelated by symbiotic liaisons. And this becomes a little bit clearer when I talk about, you know, sort of these dance formations in public spaces. So what I want to do today is unpack a genre of uh, video that all of us who follow Iran are quite familiar with. It's the short video of spontaneous dance and joy in public spaces, usually performed by women. I'll give you an example. Um, the following slide that I'm going to play for you in a sec um, went viral in May of 2021 and was back then immediately sort of within short order viewed by about 2 million people uh, people across different platforms. And there are hundreds of uh, comments under, under each of those postings. Uh, and what we see in this video is a young woman dancing to the Los Angeles singer Andy's song, Dokhtar Iruni, Iranian Girl. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning, obviously, sort of the how many times it's been viewed is that, you know, we always need to consider not just the people who are present in that instance, but the many, many times that these videos get redistributed and remediated and shared afterwards. So let me see if my audio and everything is going to work. Um, here's a short excerpt. This is one of dozens of others like it, where we see people, especially women, as I mentioned, dancing in public, often to folkloric, pre-revolutionary or expatriate music, intoning a soundscape that is prevalent within these alternative or parapublic spheres, but shut, up, shut out of official and public spaces, uh, unless there are insurgencies like this one in the public space. Usually there's a clear resonance of joyfulness in these performatives and an association of the joyful with the pre-Islamic, pre-revolutionary or Pahlavi culture and a disassociation of the joyful with Islamic Republic culture. These discursive tropes are plenty um, in the comments sections. Um, so if we... Uh... <laughs> The Metro sort of uh, video is, is, is also a very recurrent sort of uh, trope within, these, uh, within this genre. But if we look at some of the commentary, for example, um, you know, uh, a free Iran, and I'm looking at the second one that is far from ignorance, a free and joyous Iran. Um, you know, these uh, a free Iran, uh, a free of the Islamic republics is associated with um, a joyous Iran. And, um, you know, the, that celebrating and dancing, and I'm looking at the last comment, um, that that day when Iranians are finally free, they will bring into the streets um, something that is quite natural to them, such as the, you know, private sociality that they practice and that we have now over the last years um, really engaged in on social media, which uh, Iranians on a daily basis are interacting with. So how do we interpret the hundreds of micro videos of dance and joyful conduct that have circulated in the Iranian media sphere? And can these fragmented media forms and the discursive spaces that they provide serve as a sort of epistemological possibility for our study of social processes? And if so, how? In most other political and social contexts, including Middle Eastern ones, the video I just showed you of the girl dancing um, in front of the metro would not be viral worthy. But in Iran, these videos that captured, uh, capture public and usually spontaneous in instances of joyful music and dance began to constitute a genre that were circulated widely for a few years before the 2022 revolutionary uprising, engaging national as well as transnational diasporic audiences. Videos exhibiting this genre of one might call performative counter-publicity appeared in the online sphere around 2016 and 2017, and over the years of their constitution as a recognizable genre, it proved certain politically rooted affective meanings. As I will discuss both in their production as well as their wide circulation, these videos have come to serve a poetic world making in which assemblages of joyful spaces and affects are posited as counter to a state that promotes an ethos of grief hence rendering these videos politically salient. 
Furthermore, I argue that the state's disciplinary biopolitics, which is concerned with regulating the vices that might arise from the bodies of women in particular, is taken to task in these videos by a preponderance of women enacting the untethering of their bodies from state control. An overarching concern of my work here is to articulate an idea of affective and performative joy as a revolutionary in the specific Iranian context, conditioned as it is by a unique form of Islamist government. Although in recent years, the idea of joy as transformative or even radical has percolated in writings about Black lives, especially in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, whereby joy is often formulated as an act of resistance, joy is an important political force is all but ignored by the social sciences uh, in most other contexts. And that's a quote from a publication uh, by a research project at Yale, actually, on the theology of joy and the good life. Now, they're not looking specifically uh, at Iran, but just generally trying to um, theorize around the notion of joy. So uh, what's all the crying about? From anyone, for anyone who knows post-revolutionary Iran, establishing that the Islamic Republic has since its inception promulgated an ethos of mourning would be superfluous. However, although this particular politics has colored every aspect of Iran's social and political life over the last 40 some years, there's no serious academic treatment of the subject in English or Persian. Most writings on the topic of joy are, are either within works of self, self-help or psychology or examinations of the parameters of joyful conduct, such as music and dance uh, within Islam. As the author of one of the few pieces on the subject comments, although lack of communal joy is one of the important social deprivations of contemporary Iranians, it appears there's a research lacuna. And this, is subject, uh, and this subject has not been treated seriously in Iranian sociology. Um, perhaps researchers have regarded the subject matter as too light um, for academic work. In the Iranian academy, researchers may have found the topic too sensitive politically. Although the distinguished theorist Hannah Arendt wrote about the subject of happiness in her book On Revolution already in 1963, commenting on the difference, as uh, some of you will know, between the French and American revolutions and that the outcome of the latter afforded for happiness, it appears that most other writings on the subject, especially in the last few decades, have viewed topics such as joy and hope within culturalist and consumerist entrapments that purvey a particular mode of living informed by false consciousness, uh, neoliberal economies. Um, I believe, okay. Given these entanglements, for my own work, it's important to articulate a concept of joy that gives serious consideration to the affective and embodied politics at play in the circulation of the dance video genre at the center of my discussion here. So when the 1979 revolution happened, one of the revolutionaries' main charges was that the Pahlavi monarchy had ruled Iranian society with westernizing policies, alienating it from any sense of authenticity. As is well known, this was best encapsulated in the writer Jalal Ol Ahmad's term Occidentosis in the 1960s, where he elaborates, I speak of Occidentosis as of tuberculosis, um, a disease... <laughs> a disease that strikes a social body from within. <laughs> Entailed in this critique of occidentosis, often translated as West toxification, was the notion of a society removed from its own roots and culture, one that imitated the consumerism and entertainment culture of the West, and in brief, lacked dignity and gravitas. In their interpretations of the cultural contingencies that culminated in the revolution, the revolutionaries, and especially the Islamists among them, had created an ontological link between joyous entertainment or community and Pahlavi-era social westoxicated depravity. When the revolution succeeded, entertainment centers like cinemas, concert halls, and cabarets were some of the first establishments to be vandalized and burned to the ground. Legions of entertainers left the country for exile, uh, the new revolutionary state was firmly established on Islamic principles, and in one of his early speeches, Khomeini compared pre-revolutionary society um, to addicts. Let me see if I can. Yep. He said, 
all the time he's just wondering when it'll be summer and when he can go to the beach when it'll finally be evening so he can go to the cinema when certain programs will be on television so he can sit and watch just like an opium addict and that's exactly what they want those who want to rob us they want to rob us without being bothered they say let's create this path of fun and pleasure for them and uh they entertain themselves while we rob them Elsewhere, Khomeini had declared various versions of the theme above um, in one speech saying they wanted to empty our brains, replace the brain of a serious person with lahwalabi um, brain using the Quranic term for lahwalab, which it translates to idle talk or fun and games and has been used by jurists for centuries to interpret scriptural injunctions against music and entertainment. Of course, a large segment of the Iranian population was religious and engaged in Shia rites before the revolution. Um, many of these communal traditions are commemorations of the death or martyrdom of imams and other sanctities and involve nohe, eulogy recitations, and collective crying. But with the revolution, Khomeini highlighted the political potential of crying uh, in his speeches and elevated the nature of these religious commemorations above and beyond religion and reframed them as anti-imperialist communal experiences that were central to the survival of the newly born Islamic nation. In one speech, the charismatic leader told the worshiping crowd, I believe I have this one in a slide as well, um, it is not so that you should imagine crying is crying. No, it's not crying. It's a political, psychological, social issue. It saves the essence of our religion. All over the country, there should be mourning gatherings. All should be mourning and all should be crying. Elsewhere, Khomeini said, we are a nation of political crying. We are a nation that will cause floods with our tears and tear down the dams that, uh, that stand against Islam. Once the new... Um, once the new regime was firmly established, it gradually imposed a culture of, culture of mourning that had both religious and political exigencies in many spheres of life. State-affiliated foundations and organizations heavily funded mourning commemorations. The morality committees policed bodies and considered dark colors, especially in women's clothing, as the only acceptable revolutionary attire. And state media broadcast a preponderance of sad eulogies and music. Um, and religious and political authorities expressed dismay at the celebration of joyous Persian holidays, which to this day constitute the most important holidays for Iranians. In their rare article on religion and joy in post-revolutionary Iran mentioned before, uh, Gilvoi and Savji examined the positions of religious conservatives, moderates and reformists, and conclude that all but some reformist clerics oppose activities generally associated with joy, such as most music, dancing, clapping, and even the celebration of pre-Islamic holidays. They also quote other occasional newspaper articles commenting on the lack of communal joy, with one writer commenting, many of our preachers and eulogists spread false ideas in society about joy and Islam. In their view, joy is an issue that is abominable at best and haram at worst. With this perspective, Islam has become a religion of depression and grief mourning and weeping. So, um, you know, that is sort of setting the, uh, the, the, the state ideology counterpoint to the scenes that I'm, uh, that I'm examining in this chapter of the micro dance events and dance clips. Uh, why all this anxiety um, over dance? Um, now, because of the particular injunctions that jurors have used to interpret Islamic ban on most kinds of joyful music and dance, these two art forms are the most problematic within uh, post-revolutionary Iran. However, for various political and pragmatic reasons um, that I've examined in my book, uh, Soundtrack of the Revolution, actually, um, strict views toward Islam, even, Khomeini, uh, even Khomeini's own, gave way to flexible policies on the subject so that today you can attend, you know, dozens of joyful music concerts um, any month, except for when they're uh, major sort of religious uh, mourning um, commemorations for the imams or the prophet. The word dance is basically illegal in Iran and has been replaced in public discourse with the term harakate muzum, which translates to rhythmic movements. Um, so, you know, state organs uh, 
uh, make sure that the word dance is never mentioned on state television. There was actually an incident not too long ago on Shabe Yaldo on the longest um, night of the year when a guest mentioned the word dance and this created some major problems and ultimately the um, TV pres presenter had to resign from her position for not having, um, even though she, she objected, but she apparently didn't object um, fiercely enough and didn't apologize enough to the viewers for uh, the, the guest simply mentioning that um, it's healthy for people to dance. Um, there was another incident um, uh, that was very much on sort of, you know, um, display in, in, um, on social media sites where, and I'll just briefly talk about it, in 2019, um, there was um, a famous Joyce, uh, uh, there was a famous uh, uh, expatriated musician, Sassi Mankan, which many of you uh, will know, um, who released a track called Gentleman. Uh, this went viral and led to dozens of copycat videos of school children dancing to the song, sometimes orchestrated and filmed by their own teachers. Uh, let me see. I have um, I have a slide, but um, I can admit this. I think I have to admit this person before I can move on. Is that possible? Okay. I'm just going to quickly. Sorry, I'm going to. Okay, um, I'm just going to share this again. I believe I just lost the share. Can you see my shared screen of the slides or can somebody let me know if they can see my shared? Yes, okay. This is bizarre. I mean, something's happening on my end that's a bit strange. Um, it looks apologies. fine to me. It was fine. Can you now. see the? Oh, can you see this now or no? Uh, not now, but I, we saw. Not now. You could see it before. Yes. Okay. Let me see. Let's see, try again. I didn't see. Okay. How about now? Yes. Great. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So um, conservative, I'm just going to play you a little bit of what this looked like. These are just three or four videos of what we saw coming from, um, you know, these schools. But th this was a, a real sort of earthquake in Iran. All the schools were playing the song and there are so many videos of kids dancing to this song um, all over the place. <laughs> Conservatives rose in fear and parliament released a statement that the Minister of Education should deal severely with directors whose schools were involved in participating in this dance wave. And the absurdity of this extreme political reaction was on display in the stark contrast between school children dancing and grown men in parliament calling for their censure. It is within this context that we can understand the viral circulation of dance videos as staging performative counterpublicness and publicity vis-a-vis -vis the dominant political ideology. But to understand how we got to this moment, we have to look back to um, uh, 2009. I had some of the reactions to this dance video where uh, actually I'll, I'll briefly look at some of them. Um, you know, the last one says, Sasi Kariki Boyno Kad, uh, Falgat, Hoyt, Chehil, Solivizar, Atapangoish, or Islamiro Kolandu Chud, 
Uh, that means, you know, with his song, Sassy basically um, disappeared the 40 years of efforts on behalf of the Ministry of um, Islam and uh, Islamic Guidance and Culture. So it's, it's, it's being represented as the Islamic Republic having lost the cultural war or the cultural uh, sort of the Islamization of Iranians that it had preferred um, at the very beginning and of course continues to try to regulate um, in terms of the young, especially of the young through schooling and all of that. And so a lot of the commentary is about how, um, you know, they have basically failed to educate the young as they had um, intended to. Um, and um, and uh, let me, okay, here we go. So to understand how we got to this moment, we have to look back to 2009, the Green Uprising. With the repression of the cultural underground and um, and internet, spontaneous moments captured at home, in the streets or public transport, such as Tehran's metro and buses, played an increasingly important role in the staging of repertoires of contention. These spontaneous in-person events are much harder to trace to individuals, and as long as they're not explicitly political, but rather political meaning is read into them in the act of mediation and consumption, or secondary production, as Michel de Sartre would say, their makers are not apprehended. Indeed, not unlike the impact of print journalism on the Mashruti protest verse of the constitutional era in Iran in 1905, 1911, or the impact of small media such as cassette tapes on the production and circulation of protest sermons at the time of the 1979 revolution, Social media have fundamentally reshaped the expression of protest in contemporary Iran and the references and sensory faculties that are employed for its expression. Women, more than others, have used the affordances of online and social media to mount performative counterpublicness, whether in explicit political movements or um, joyous dance videos. And, you know, here I have some images of, uh, you know, women being actually on the forefront of a lot of the social and political change and activism that happens in Iran. And they're equally um, equally active online. Um, they have staged what Faisal Nimilani in the realm of literature calls a revolution within two revolutions. In the counterpublics and in the claim-making repertoires that are staged within these non-state supported spheres, women are on the front lines. Um, there are hundreds of short video clips in circulation on social media, many, meld the corporeal embodiment of a nostalgic pre-revolutionary imaginary, purveying soundscapes that create spaces and condition, discipline and move bodies in function perhaps not so different from what Charles Hirschkin describes as the ethical soundscapes of Cairo. Though in, the context, in that context, cassette tapes of Islamic sermons served as vehicles for ethical self-improvement and pious living, whereas these joyous Iranian soundscapes work to rupture the state's Islamic disciplining of bodies. And in these hundreds of independent microclips circulated on social media, the majority, again, are of women staging the kinds of street-level, face-to-face repertoires of spontaneity invoked earlier, where women flout officially sanctioned frameworks for public comportment and use their bodies to stage what Marwan Kredi has called creative insurgencies. The common spaces below these circulated videos, um, uh, um, uh, one, uh, you know, when you when you look at them, you can sort of, <laughs> you can kind of anticipate the majority of the comments when you look at the comments of, on a couple of these videos. Uh, I have um, a couple that I've translated here. Here, Nail Tattoo Arzu writes, they've taken away our joy, a sad people always mourning and eulogizing. Another commenter says, in the end, they will even arrest God for the cry crime of creating women. And another says, um, the columns of Islam are shaking with this dance. So let's dance until this Islamic state is destroyed. Dance so we dance. Berach, still berach sin. It's a challenge to the state. It's a challenge to um, basically bring down the state through not, um, not you know, uh, raising arms and political... Uh, as the way we've usually understood political uh, insurgencies, but um, bringing down the state through a performance of um, this um, other hidden culture, um, dance and music. What makes people take note of these instances of public dancing, record them and post them on social media 
is that the mounting of such joyous counterpublics in the public space have by now accumulated affective value, a sort of stickiness, to use um, Sarah Ahmed's term, a repetition. Uh, let me just admit this person. Um, okay. Um, a stickiness, to use Sarah Ahmed's term, a repetition that signals this very simple act as a significant, perhaps political repertoire within the given context. Stripped of possibilities in the cultural underground, public spaces become theaters of performance. Indeed, one might take the term theater literally, because not unlike theater, these live performatives are ephemeral, and in their brief staging, allow for a processual moment, momentary fleeting uh, feeling of affinity in which spectators experience themselves as a congenial public constituted by the performance's address. These assemblages, um, you know, agencement, these assemblages that mount onto public spaces in these micro but communal acts and then are mass mediated on social media point us toward a narrative that diverges from official productions. On these representational sites, as Henri Lefebvre uh, calls them, we see alternative representations of the kinds of sites that Islamic Republic institutions have enforced on public spaces. These alternative sites perform a poetic world making, imagining a more an open permissive public sphere, sphere, one in which women are at least equal, if not leading a kind of public space that those engaged in this counter public would like to inhabit. And, in, um, and for a few hours or days, they manage to mount these imaginaries onto these spaces, whether on the streets or in the metro or in their virtual circulation um, in the parallel public sphere exercise on social media. Or as Dolan states, utopian performatives in their doings make palpable an affective vision of how the world might be better. Importantly, these mediated dance videos create communal experiences that mirror the embodied communal mourning publics whose importance Khomeini highlighted in his speeches in the early years of the revolution. While those publics were affectively rooted in Shia traditions revived in the country's anti-imperialist revolution, these dance videos and the discursive sites that accompany them often draw on nostalgic pre-revolutionary music and joyous affects that have been denigrated by the country's religious authorities. It's not surprising that women are on the forefront of many of the actual political campaigns and of the counterpublic microclips, the video microclips. As women, their repression and subjugation is a heightened form of the kind of restrictions to which the rest of the population is subject, where even deeply intimate matters such as dress and public comportment are subject to punishment. It is in this context that we understand bodily performance of spontaneity and joy, but also self-immolation, I'm thinking of uh, the woman who um, burned herself um, in being denied to watch a soccer game. And since then, the state has tried to at least leave one section for women to be able to attend some soccer games. But the control over the body as liberating acts, precisely because the same force that subjugates them is involved in infantilizing the rest of the population and is at the core intertwined with people's control over their own bodies and sexuality. Hence the Woman Life Freedom Uprising's protest slogan that is um, that it is only with women's liberty that everyone will have liberty. This is resonant of the Kambahi River feminist collective statement that until black women are free, none of us are free, which has reverberations also in the Kurdish slogan, Jinjian Azadi, from which the Persian Zanzandigi Azadi arises. What we witnessed in the Women Life Freedom Uprising was a colliding of women's activist, political, and literal worlds and movements with the affective, performative dimensions of the women's non-movement, a term the sociologist Bayot uses to refer to non-organized, everyday kinds of actions that culminate in um, perceptible forces. Almost from the start of this movement, there were videos of women dancing, of claiming their bodily autonomy, but also other joyful performative pieces of people handing out candies or couples kissing that flooded social media. When people were killed in the movement, including uh, Mahsa Jina Amini, uh, whose death ignited the movement, um, people circulated videos of them dancing. Let me take it forward. Um, I have... These, um, this is um, 
one of the more recurrent sort of um, one of the more popular videos of a woman. There was a huge gathering around a fire where a woman very dramatically throws her veil into the fire. The next one is Khodanur Lejei, the Baluchi guy who became an icon of the movement. And once he died, you know, he was a he was a um, Instagram sort of dance celebrity or influencer in Baluchistan. And so people started circulating all these videos of him um, being alive, being joyous and dancing. And um, people also tried to surface, resurface videos of Mahsa Amini um, dancing. So I'm just going to show you these three. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately too short. Um, it is these utopian performatives of a world beyond the Islamic Republic, one that is full of joy and dance, one that posits freedom against containment, life against death, that shines the light forward and offers the affective inspiration without which one might argue the political work on the ground could not be imagined and take place. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Siamadus. I think we have 10 minutes for questions. And go ahead. Yeah, I have just, um, I can't help but see uh, the, the echoes of what we're hearing now in American politics with the emphasis on the joy that um, Kamala Harris is, is said to both represent and enact. And I wondered if you had any comments on the way that that um, plays out and if you see any parallels or what might be distinct about what goes on in Iran related to that. Yeah, thank you, Anne. I was also struck by the number of times I heard the word joy in the, you know, mm -hmm. during the uh, Democratic National Convention and how much, um, you know, joy uh, is being highlighted or promoted as a force against the kind of, um, uh, you know, the kind of depression or, or um, hopelessness that a Trump presidency uh, or not the uh, Trump presidency, but the Trump campaign, I guess, has been trading in order to gain its um, its votes, and so, or it's you know bringing people into its fold. And I've been I've been thinking about this, and you know, we when we talk about the kinds of forces that are in power, sort of restrictive authoritarian forces that are in power in the Islamic Republic, and see how at the and this is not the only um, authoritarian sort of form or system that can exist. We know about, you know, so Soviet authoritarianism, where it wasn't so much about the control over the presentation of the body, but control over economic means and, and political expression and all of that. So it's not the only one, but there seems to be, um, you know, obviously a link between religiously inspired authoritarian movements and the control over women's bodies. And um, so we see, we see that obviously in Iran, and I think we see that a lot in the kind of politics that the Republicans led by uh, Donald Trump um, are pushing in the United States with the you know, reversal of Roe v. Wade and so on. And um, I think it's pretty smart of uh, you know, the um, Kamala Harris campaign to have kind of put their finger on that and tried to present their campaign as uh, opposing that kind of restriction and containment and authoritarianism um, that at the end of the day is linked to liberation and liberation in the human body is linked to control over one's own body and sexuality and joy. There's nothing you know, that expresses uh, control over one's destiny and life than to be able to maintain happiness and joy regardless of circumstances and so but thank you for bringing that up i've been i've been trying to think through um you know i mean i i, I feel like i need to do a count on on the number of times the word joy was um was mentioned 
Yeah. Also, the use of videos of of Harris dancing that is exactly mm -hmm. what this joy consists of. I, I really was struck by that. So, thank you so much. I really yeah. Needed, oh, thank you. She needs, she needs a little more practice, though. <laughs> <laughs> See? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for a great talk. Well, I, I learned a lot. So